you and your family looking for a city that's bursting with charm, culture, and history? Well, then you come to the right place. Welcome to Centralia. Nestled in the heart of Pennsylvania, Centralia is a hidden gem just waiting to be discovered, appreciated, and made into your home. What's that? You're feeling warm? Don't worry about it, it's just the Pennsylvania climate. Now, take a leisure stroll down our lovely downtown area filled with quaint shops, vibrant restaurants, and friendly locales. But Centralia is so much more than just a pretty face. Our city has a rich history in the coal mining industry. Such a fascinating and lucrative field of work, the coal industry, wouldn't you say? For those who love the great outdoors, Centralia has it all. With gorgeous parks, hiking trails, and plenty of outdoor activities, you'll be able to soak up the natural beauty of our region while still enjoying the amenities of a bursting city. Hey now, where are you? going? No, really, where are you going? Hey, hey, ho hold up. We, we don't want you going off the trail here now, buddy. Ignore the sign. The sign is it's probably a prank. Just ignore the signs. Please don't keep going past the signs. Oh, no, not the mines. Don't go to the mines, sir. Listen, there's nothing for you to find. Oh, yeah, okay, that. That's some trailer. <laughs> It's always a little strange to me when I write a script about a place or a person or phenomena uh, in America. Seeing how, one, I've never been there, and two, the absolute majority of the viewers of this channel are from there. But just like my sex life, I won't let a small thing stop me, and even if you've seen it before, you can still be both terrified and amused. So please keep that in mind while I, a Swedish man, tell you, statistically an American, about an American town that I have never been to. So starting off with like the original history of the town, I honestly am not that interested in it because I have to imagine that it was originally owned by Native Americans and then it was either taken from them or bought from them by the white man at some point. In fact, let me go off script for just a second and look it up. I wasn't gonna mention it at all, but... So, uh, no, no. Uh, many of the Native American tribes in what is now Columbia County sold the land that makes up Centralia to colonial agents in 1749 for 500 pounds. Who would have thought? Anyway, in 1856, two mines opened up in Centralia, the Locust Run Mine and the Coal Ridge Mine. These were then followed by the Hazel Del Colliery Mine in 1860, Centralia Mine in 1862, Continental Mine in 1863, and the Border Ape Crypto Mine in 1864. I made that last one up because I'm fucking hilarious. After the Wall Street crash of 1929, however, something something crypto joke here, all mines but one were shut down. That, however, didn't stop the so-called bootleg miners. No, Onision, not those kinds of miners. <laughs> bootleg miners are people who keep mining from closed down mines, selling off whatever they manage to get out of it for their own profit. One technique often used by these people is what is known as pillar robbing, which is when the bootleg miners would extract the coal from the pillars supporting the roof of the mines. This is Obviously very dangerous, but if you can do it without getting crushed, it can be pretty lucrative since the professional miners who were here before you wouldn't have touched those pillars with a 10-foot pole and therefore you can extract quite a lot of coal out of them. This however caused several of the abandoned mines to eventually collapse, which will become important later. That's pretty much all the setup we need except for one more thing that will also become important later. In 1950 the Centralia Council acquired the rights to everything mined from the mines. This means that the town of Centralia can do whatever they seem fit with whatever is extracted from the mines instead of possibly having to give it up to the state of Pennsylvania. That's a little bit simplified but in a nutshell that's what happened. Now let's get into the meat and bones of this story a little bit. Experts apparently cannot agree on exactly what started the series of unfortunate events that I'm about to describe, but as far as I understand it, these are the three most commonly accepted versions of the events. So Centralia had a landfill, and in May of 1962, the Centralia Council hired five men from the volunteer fire company to clean up said landfill. Now this had been done several times before, about once a year or so, however the trash pit had now moved from wherever it used to be to a new location, an abandoned strip mine pit just a little outside of town. So the men get to work collecting all the trash or whatever is there, uh, sorting it into a pile like they have before and then sets the landfill on fire. Once enough time has passed they put the fire out and go on their merry way. But little do they know that inside that landfill is still a teeny tiny little flame boy who just sneaky sneaks his way down into a little hole in the ground. 
that's the first version of the event. Version 2 is very similar to the first one, but it happened one day before. And instead of these five men, there was a trash hauler who dumps coal discarded from coal burners into the trash pit, not knowing that the coal is still hot. This is backed up by the fact that the Centralia Council apparently referred to in, like, their meeting protocols or something, the two fires at the dump. They learned about these fires because of the five firemen that apparently billed them for fighting the fire in the landfill area. Of note with this is that, as far as I understand it, the council was responsible by law to install fire-resistant clay walls between each layer of the landfill, but they had fallen behind schedule and the barriers had been left incomplete. The third theory says that this had nothing to do with either the five firemen or the trash hauler, and instead says that everything that's about to happen is a result of the 1932 Bast Colliery fire. This has, however, been disputed by a man called Frank Jurgel Sr., who claims to have operated a bootleg mine with his brother near the landfill between 1960 and 1962. Now you'll have to excuse me that I've been a little bit vague so far, saying shit like everything that's about to happen and shit like that, but I just wanted to give you all of the necessary setup without really spoiling what's about to happen. But now we're getting into it. Let's jump ahead to 1979, 17 years later. Gas station owner and mayor of Centralia, John Coddington, great name by the way, I appreciate that, wakes up in his bed. He gets out of bed, walks into his kitchen and grabs a cup of coffee. <sighs> he walks outside and goes to his underground fuel tanks. Once there, he opens up the big metal lid, takes out a dipstick and lowers it down into the tank. He notes down on a little piece of paper how much gas is left in the tank and then begins to fish it back up. As he does so, however, he notices something a little peculiar. The dipstick in his hand now feels kind of warm, like it's hot. Confused about this, he makes his way back into the gas station, takes out a thermometer and attaches it to a string. He walks back out to the fuel tank, lowers it down, and after a minute or two has passed, he pulls it back out again. The thermometer showed 172 nonsensical Fahrenheit, or 77.8 galaxy brain Celsius. Now, if you haven't caught on already, during that landfill fire, or coal dumping, or whatever it may have been 17 years earlier, fire had found its way into the old mines beneath the town of Centralia. Over the years, this fire had spread underneath the entire town and was now at a point where it would be impossible to put out. And one of the reasons that the fire had not been able to be stopped is the fact that the bootleg miners had collapsed several of the entries to several of the mines, making it impossible to shut the tunnels off completely before the fire found its way deeper and leading into other mines. Now, as far as I understand it, most of the citizens of Centralia was vaguely aware of this, but this whole gas station incident, of course, garnered a lot of attention, but not as much as what would come next. I put the microphone on and set this camera up and then I sat down in the bathtub just because I forgot uh, to say, you know, like and subscribe. These are the lengths that I'm willing to go to. Please uh, just do those things. Even if you hated the video, like you're not losing anything. Oh, and leave a comment. Just it can say whatever as well. I mean, it would be nice if it's a comment about the actual video, but if not, just Mr. Beast it. Just like leave your favorite emoji, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I would appreciate it. Okay, back to the video. On February 14th of 1981, little 12 year old Todd Dombowski, another banger of a name, was out playing in his backyard. Hey, check out this hella sweet backflip, bro. There with him was his cousin, 14-year-old Eric Wolfgang. Dude, I'm 14 now. I'm too old for backflips. I play with adult shit now. Whoa, what's that? You know what? You're probably too young. It's more of a, like a 14-year-old thing, but uh, essentially it's a wheel and a stick, and then you, you use the stick to push the wheel, and it kind of rolls down a hill, and it's pretty fucking Whoa, epic, bro, so then it goes... A sinkhole opens up in the ground. Todd falls into the 150-foot deep hole, and I don't know how, but my boy Eric Wolfgang here, which, like I said, only good names in this story, uh, but he pulls some fucking type of hero moves and gets Todd out of the hole, saving his life. 
Now following this incident, of course, a bunch of scientists and other important people came to figure this whole situation out. And when measuring the hot steam billowing from this hole, it was found to contain a lethal level of carbon monoxide, which, you know, forms when fuel such as, oh, I don't know, coal, for example, is being burned. Now, despite this fucking gate to hell opening in the middle of town, and there also apparently being visible evidence of fire, which I can't interpret in any other way than that there was literally visible flames that you could see with your own eyes at some places around the city, the residents of Centralia were very much divided about whether or not the fire posed a direct threat to the town. And listen, I know this goes without saying, but a fucking sinkhole in the ground just opened up in the middle of where you live, guys. How much more of a direct threat do you need? Like, I imagine these people just being like, hmm, yeah, is it really that bad though? Well, your son almost died in it. Yeah, yeah, but what was he wearing? What? What was he wearing? What was he wearing? I don't know, why? No, it's just, I, I don't know, it doesn't look that dangerous to me. Maybe he was asking for it. That same year, 1983, the US Congress allocated more than $42 million to relocation efforts. Nearly all the residents ended up accepting the government's buyout offer. This resulted in over 500 buildings being demolished and over a thousand people moving out of Centralia. In 1990, the yearly census recorded 63 remaining residents in the town. In 1992, Pennsylvania governor Bob Casey invoked eminent domain on all property in the town and condemned all the buildings within it. The remaining citizens, all 60 or so of them I guess, tried overturning this action but failed. In 2002, the US Postal Service discontinued the zip code for Centralia. By 2006, only 16 homes remained. These 16 were reduced down to 11 in 2009 when the formal evictions began. In 2010, only 5 homes remained. Where once stood an ordinary small US town, now is what appears only as an empty field with paved streets running through it. In some of the areas, an attempt to grow a forest has begun. And I don't know much about anything, but I do not understand the urge to grow a fucking forest on top of the fire city. But okay. The road leading up to Centralia, a now abandoned part of the Pennsylvania Route 61, is filled with signs warning of the risk of carbon monoxide poisoning. And at places there are cracks in the ground where smoke and steam can be seen coming up. The old road was blocked off in 1993, but a small opening on the blockade has allowed people to still go there if they want to. One part of the road leading into town has been nicknamed Graffiti Highway, a uh, name kind of self-explanatory due to all the cool art that people have created all over it. That is, up until April of 2020, when the property's current owners made the decision to cover up the graffiti and most of the road with dirt. But hold on, I hear you say. Current property owners? Isn't the town abandoned? Well, just about, but not quite. Uh, let's look at some numbers. Not all of them are completely up to date, like you'll hear. But as of 2011, the Centralia Council still had regular meetings. It was reported that the town's highest bill was a power utility bill which landed at a mind-boggling $92. And it was noted in the protocols that the town's budget was, and I quote, in the black. In 2012, the seven residents of Centralia, including, of course, the council president, filed a suit claiming that the condemnation of Centralia was no longer necessary as the fire under the city had, according to them, moved enough and that the air quality had been tested and now had the same quality as of the somewhat nearby city, Lancaster. In response to this, the Commonwealth Court ruled in favor of the Centralia citizens and the condemnation was effectively removed. The remaining residents settled their lawsuit, receiving $218,000 in compensation for the value of their homes, along with $131,500 to settle additional claims, and they were given the right to stay for the rest of their lives right there in their homes in Centralia, the city that once was and now lives on as a vague memory, literally standing on top of a burning fire that is estimated to keep on burning for 250 years. The 
This is a Rolodex style SD card holder uh, that I use to store my SD cards. And for every patron I get between this video and the next, I'll show another uh, quirky thing that I own. Okay. So, as we start nearing the end of the video, I usually like to throw in some random little facts and interesting tidbits that I encountered during the writing. So, here we go. Remember how I mentioned that in 1950, Centralia Council acquired the rights to all of the mines beneath Centralia? Well, some of the residents of Centralia are convinced that the threat was never as big as it was made up to be, and while I think that's fucking ridiculous, I have to admit that the reason that they think that does hold some interesting points. You see, according to the municipality laws of the state of Pennsylvania, when a municipality can no longer form a functioning municipal government, i.e. when there's no longer any resident, the borough legally ceases to exist, and that would mean that if the state of Pennsylvania actually succeeded in evicting all of the residents, which sure, costed them a few million dollars and a few hundred thousand dollars in buyouts and another few hundred thousand in demolition costs and stuff like that, the ownership of the mineral rights of the mines under Centralia would revert back to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Now, why would they care about this, you may ask? Well, the mines beneath Centralia are believed to be full of anthracite coal. And I'm not even gonna pretend that I know anything about this, but from Googling, it seems that anthracite coal is by far the most expensive and rare coal in the world, making up only 1% of the global coal reserves, and it is extremely rare. Like these mines apparently might contain anthracite coal worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Another funny little tidbit is that in 1966 a time capsule was buried and it was supposed to be opened in 2016. But after someone attempted to unearth and steal the capsule, uh, the residents of the town decided to open it up a couple of years early in 2014. The time capsule contained one miner's helmet, one miner's lamp, a bible, local souvenirs, a pair of bloomers signed by the men of Centralia in 1966, and, funniest of all, to me, some coal. There was just some coal in it, <laughs> you know, like the stuff that ruined the town. Something else that I learned is that there is also an active church in the town, which has been found to be standing on solid rock ground and therefore has been claimed to not be in any danger of collapsing. They still hold weekly services every Sunday. The town has four cemeteries and all of them, including one on a hilltop that literally has smoke rising out of it, are well maintained to this day and I wanna go there! I wanna go to the fucking smoke cemetery, are you kidding me? I'm picturing that it looks exactly like fucking Night of the Living Dead or some Ed Wood film. It's on a hill as well? Ah, oh, that's so sick. And finally, some numbers. Number of residents, five. Racial makeup of the town, 80% white, 20% Asian. One resident, that's 20% of them for those of you keeping count, was under the age of 18. And that's the story of Centralia. Um, I should have some closing words, but I really don't feel like I have a lot. The town of Centralia is weird and cool, and I just wanna go there, but by the time that I'll visit the States, uh, it'll probably be too late, so I'll have to make do with all of the YouTube videos I've been able to find. By the way, if you're here because you're one of the people on YouTube who's posted a video of the place, uh, sorry that I stole it from you. Uh, if it makes you feel any better, I'm not really making any money off of these videos. <laughs> this was another one of those kind of impromptu videos, so if it looks uh, a little shittier or if it felt a little bit more disjointed. It's because I'm still trying to get faster at making these videos, so sorry about that. Uh, somewhere on screen right now are, are, are all... Okay, my memory card ran out of memory uh, just as I was about to end it off, so now I'm shooting this from my stream camera. A uh, good segue into saying, hey, uh, I'm on Twitch, come hang out if you want to. We're gonna be watching VHS horror films soon, that's gonna be cool. But yes, I was just about to say that in Joker Man font, you've got my patron producers on screen somewhere right now, and they get the privilege to stay on screen while the rest of my patrons roll by in a plain old Arial font without as much as a stroke or a shadow. Uh, in actuality, I'm very thankful to uh, everyone who's a patron. Thank you so much. 
And uh, if you're watching this, aren't a patron and you want to help me, you know, keep making these videos, check out the Patreon link somewhere on the screen right now. If you're still here and you like this video, thank you so much for watching. You'll probably like this video where I talk about Roy Sullivan, let's say. Let's put that one there because the YouTube algorithm didn't like that one. Okay, cool. See you next time. Bye-bye.